like it sits there. Um, but wherever you are and whenever you are, and if I could get um, my pooch to stop hitting the camera there, there. Um, for those of you who are regular, so you know that um, I am doing this in lockdown mode all by myself. And the one man studio sometimes has um, a seven month old Doberman pincher um, crawling all over me um, who wants to be on the show. So today um, she's sitting there with me. Normally, Normally, Tori's here, and she takes her for a walk, but um, Finley's joining us today. Anyway, uh, so you may see a bump in the camera here or a bark here and there, but that's not me. I'm, you know, the dog ate my homework. So uh, I am <laughs> glad you guys are here. If you don't know the program, this is where we talk about life. And basically, in the three big areas that I think we're most concerned with, and that's the clinical arena, how we feel, you know, stuff like depression and stress and anxiety and addictions and our relationships, all kinds of relationships, um, you know, marriage and dating and extended family and in-laws and adult siblings and kids and all of that stuff. You know, I, I was doing some some research on um on on mental illness and I, I i saw this whole thing i hadn't seen it in a while they you, you know it is genetic you know that you get it from your children so that's what i read this morning some of you can identify with that and then the performance area of life reaching our dreams and goals how does that did you know that there is there's science to how people reach goals and why people don't reach goals and I often tell people, if you're not reaching your goals, there's nothing wrong with you. But what you're trying to do is do it in a way that nobody ever is able to do it if you do it that way. So anyway, there's a science to that. We talk about that here. So let me give you the number. You can call us at 844-940-2774, 844-940-2774 to get on. Oops, I just, ouch, that Finley was... um. This is going to be an interesting show. She just, uh, she just did a little, she was gnawing on my uh, toes there, which actually, you know, felt kind of nice until her puppy teeth decided to go deeper. Um, but we want to go deeper with you. So call me at 844-940-2774 as we welcome to today's program. Um, now, I, uh, I generally start the, the show with um, one of our email questions um, from our boundaries.me subscribers. They will will send these in. And I've got one for you today. This is something that, you know, maybe not to this extreme, but I think a lot of people, a lot of people deal with in some form or fashion. And that is she calls it or he calls it his wife's financial infidelity. And so, you know, there's a lot of ways to think about that, but, but, uh, you know, finances is, are, is, or are one of the most important places for a couple to have alignment with, because when you're, you know, when you're married, right. And this all of this kind of becomes one or more than kind of becomes one, you throw your lives together and you know the finances are kind of part of the fuel that makes everything run that supplies energy to be able to do and build what you want to build in your life and when you're going two different directions in there and you're not aligned there that's a big deal and so i always um, tell couples to you know monitor and think about and look at your financial alignment and that's something that's really, really important about getting on the same page. Now, remember also, let me give you a couple of principles here. That that a marriage really, you know, when it comes to the finances or anything else, a marriage really has three stakeholders. And so there's there's three parties that have to have something coming from that bank account and that budget. There's three different parties that have to get fed from that. Number one, and the most important, is the marriage, the relationship. And so there's things that, you know, we spend our money for us, you know, like your home or your apartment or wherever it is you live. That's a you're building a life there. And that's a we thing. And so that comes out of there and a bunch of other stuff that, you know, all of your stuff that that supports us and our life together. That's one stakeholder. But then there's two other stakeholders. There's a husband and a wife, right? 
And so they each have to get something out of there because they have needs too. And so when, when couples look at this whole thing, you know, it's really, really important to decide how much goes here, how much goes there, and how much goes there. And then there's no control, right? You don't have to worry about it. Once you've decided it's 10 bucks, I don't care how you spend it, right? Or you don't care how I spend my 10. But we're aligned about that. And things like giving, you know, how do you come together for your giving? I'm, um, I sort of say a big believer. I don't, it's, it's more than like belief. It's like, I can't imagine, um, I can't imagine even thinking another way. All of the research, if you're going to get scientific about it, all the research says that you will be happier. You will be more fulfilled. You'll be less depressed. You'll Lots of good things will happen. Your immune functioning <laughs> will change if you are a giver. And, you know, I always hear people say, oh, I'd like to make, you know, when I start making some money and I really start making, because I want to do that because I want to give, never happens, basically. People that are givers are givers. And if they're making, you know, very little bit, they're giving a little of the little. And then as they grow, they give more of the grow. But but giving is basically kind of in the stuff of who somebody is. And so I would suggest you you jump on that train and get alignment with your, your spouse about that, as well as other stuff. Life's got to be balanced, hobbies and, you know, spending some time on something you like. You want some good help with that, go visit my friend Dave Ramsey. Um, some of you are familiar with Dave and some are not. But if you go, um, if you really struggle in this area of finances, go to Financial Peace University. Um, there's probably a group in your hometown. I would almost bet there is. They're all over the place. And incredible things happen. Um, Dave has some really, really, really powerful stuff on individual and household finances. Okay, so now the question. Um, how can you coexist with a divisive, um, whoops, that's not the one. Um, <laughs> that's another question, a divisive daughter-in-law, that's fun. Um, I've been dealing with my wife's financial infidelity for the past 15 years. Marriage counseling, financial counseling, or financial classes have not stopped her. I have a self-employed business that she keeps taking money from after her monthly allowance runs out. So it sounds like they've divided up the budget and the business you know, pays her a certain amount for her to go do whatever she needs to do. I warned her that I would take away her access to the business if she continues to exceed the budget. She told me if I do that, I will not see my kids anymore. We just went from a discussion to war. I mean, that's, come on. I won't see my kids anymore. This is way more than finances here, buddy. I am, I'm sorry. I'm stuck between fear of her ruining my business and the fear of her leaving and taking the kids if I draw a hard line. Please help. Um, so here's what here's what I would say. I think that um, that you are thinking correctly about this. That whenever somebody is out of control, okay, and they're not taking responsibility for their own actions and their own choices then that is number one when we step in and try to help them okay which you've done you're talking about counseling and talking to her and this and the other but she's not facing this problem and she's still in denial about her overspending well that's one thing if it's somebody's own house that they're doing that in but what you're talking about here this is a classic boundaries scenario where her out of control behavior now your household and your business, which fuels both of your lives together, you say is at risk because she's out of control. Now you guys are experiencing the collateral damage of that. And that's why I say you're thinking about this right, where you have to say, um, look, we have an agreement here and we're gonna commit to this agreement. And you, you know, it sounds like she's done that. And it's very clear we have mutually agreed upon expectations that if you exceed this, then you are not going to get any more. In fact, your access is going to be cut off. So I think that's a great way to think about this. 
Now, whenever, um, whenever we have really good reasonable limits and boundaries to protect ourselves, and somebody gets retaliatory, which she is, she says, I'm going to retaliate by taking the kids away from you. Okay, number one, number one, have you ever heard the the uh, you ever heard the term? You know, you don't negotiate with terrorists. Why? Well, because it doesn't help, basically. Okay, and so if somebody has has character issues to the point that they would deprive their own children of their father, then that's not a reasonable, logical discussion about money anymore. Okay, it's not even a reasonable, logical discussion about co-parenting anymore, and it's a, it's it's a it's a classic, you know, re- retaliatory. I don't know any other word, a way to, you know, it's a counterstrike. So she sees a Katori, which means she sees it as you're doing something to her. So she's going to do something back to you. Well, you're not doing anything to her. Okay, she's doing something to herself because there are any limits. She hasn't um, experienced that. So I think you have a much bigger issue than the uh, than the finances here. Um, there's a serious breakdown in in the the oneness and the unity of the relationship. It sounds like in large part because of some of her character issues. So what I would do is tell her. You know, we can't we can't continue to go spending more than we can spend or we're going to be out of business. OK, so um, we have a financial issue. But when I told you that and you threatened me with the kids, it's made me aware that we have a much bigger problem and we're not on the same page. And so if that's the level it's gotten to, then I would make a demand. I'd say, we're, I'm going to have to solve this financial problem one way or the other. I would like for us to work it out together and we're going to go to marriage counseling. And so I want you to go. And in that, I want you to talk about the whole picture now. And basically to, to your question about the fear of her t- leaving and taking the kids, um, I you know, typically this is like when you do an intervention with an alcoholic or an addict, they're always going to threaten a lot of things. And sometimes they even follow through and she may even, you know, separate and go that route. But I don't think that that's the kind of manipulation and stuff you give into. I think you, you hold your boundary and say, well, you could do that. That would be really, really hurtful if you chose to do that. I would rather us go to the counselor together and figure out how we're going to do this and figure out the bigger issue of how did we get so sideways. So I would treat it as a marriage problem, not just a a finance problem. Okay. Uh, 844-940-2774. 844-940-2774. 844-940-2774 is the number you get on the program. And um, let's go to the phones and talk to Lynn, who's calling us from the Big D. Lynn, welcome to the program. Hi, thank you for taking my call. You're very welcome. Um, How can I help you? I have a weird question. I, you can tell me I'm crazy. <laughs> it's fine. I, I, I can handle it. But I am so. Lynn, I would never tell you you're sure. crazy. I would say we're. I would say we're all yeah. crazy, and we're just joining <laughs> arms and trying to get to the next step. All right. <laughs> I mean, what reasonable okay, person? So think about this. What what reasonable person would do up here? Up here would try to do a live broadcast with a crazy dog <laughs> in their lap like this. Now, who would do that? So you're talking to a person you here, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. All you right, and so Finley are both crazy, and I'm right there with we you. Are, we are. So how, how can I help you? Okay, so um, I am emotionally insecure. I don't know. I don't know if I want to say insecure or vulnerable, or but everything in my life it just seems like if someone looks at me crossways, I want to cry, and I I, I want to get a grip on my emotions so I can start thriving instead of 
crumbling. Hmm. That's good goal. So, you know, there, I, I like to think of, um, there's this kind of fulcrum, you know, we cross over this hill from, from just trying to survive and, you know, people have a lot of bad things happen to them and, you know, the equipment gets broken and life's really hard and you're just trying every day, you get up and you're trying to survive. The goal is to, to strengthen yourself to where you can then get on the other side of the hill where we're looking at from surviving to thriving. And that's, you put that well. So when you say that you are um, emotionally, you said insecure and, and, and a lot of emotional sensitivity, what are you, what are you insecure about? What, what are you sensitive about? Are you to, well, to be put down or rejected or the world's yeah. going to fall apart yeah. or what, what, what's going on? Um, it's more about me, people not liking me. I don't know if it's a fear or if it's just my, my nature of being sensitive or highly critical of myself, but it's like, I, it's a self fulfilling prophecy when my husband walks in the door and he doesn't notice I did my hair. And then I start getting, you know, start falling apart. Like, you don't even care. I did my hair. Or if I go out with my friends and they, oh, they talk no. more about them than me, you know, it's like every aspect of everything feels like it's everything's working against me. And, and then I start to become emotionally down. Like I, I'm not yeah. good enough. Yeah. And it's all about this. It's mainly in kind of this approval arena. Do people approve of you? It is. Yep. Okay. That's, that's, well, that's very important to me and it's not happening. Here's the good news. Here's the good news. As illnesses okay. go, that's one of the least serious ones. Okay. Isn't that good news? It's an illness. <laughs> well, not well, that it's an illness. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm using a metaphor here. Okay. You know, it's sort of like, Oh, you know, okay. if, if you think of, if you think of all sorts of illnesses, right. So, um, you know, there's cancer and there's, you know, really, really serious stuff that will, you know, is really difficult to deal with all the way up to, you know, we get to, you know, where we've, you know, we got a stomach bug or something. And so I, right. I'm just saying mm-hmm. that, that whether or not people approve of us, that is, and here's why I say that that's a later developmental need. So if you take a child, for example, there are really basic things like, do they have secure attachments? You know, are they lovable? Forget about approving, you know, they're just, can they, can they invest emotionally? And, and then, then you learn, then the next thing is you you kind of get a sense of your boundaries. And then after that, and it goes up the, the food chain here to where then we're worrying about our performance. And so basically that can, I mean, a stomach bug can put you on your butt for three days. Right? I'm not saying that this doesn't hurt. I'm just saying the good news is that you have a lot of capacities and strengths that are going to help you, uh, you know, to overcome this. So um, you hit the nail on the head in one way, and that is that you realize that this starts with your self-critical voices, right? So you they're already mm-hmm. telling you you're not good enough. Nobody likes you. Everybody's going to reject you. They're already telling you that you don't need yeah. another person to be rejected in the room, right? You can do it yourself. Exactly. So then, yeah. then your husband or a friend walks in. And so you're going to, you're going to, it's sort of like a translating program. You know, we have software, somebody speaks English into it and it translates it. So the way your mm-hmm. brain works is, somebody does something like looks the other way or, you know, has, doesn't look happy or they don't look at you immediately or whatever. And your brain translates that into something about you. Exactly. So, yeah, exactly. Who, who installed that software in your head? My parents. 100% okay. my parents. Tell me, both of them. Yep. Yeah. Kind of high degree of criticism. Uh, well, I caught my dad in an affair, and I told my mom, and my mom told 
my, my dad told me I, you know, what it up. And my mom basically um, let me hear that for the rest of their marriage. Your dad, your dad that, told you, you know, what? What did he say to you? Well, I'm not going to say it on the air, but he said I effed up for telling my mom that he was having an affair. Oh, and okay. Well, married. that's. And so your mom. Uh, now your mom was mad at you for that telling was my her. mom. Yeah, and my dad was mad too, and any marital problems they had were my fault because he had this affair and it caused the strife. And, okay, how, you know, how old, I mean, how old were you? Years old how, and old, still. How, how old were you when this happened? 13. 13. Okay, so I would, um, I would bet, and you answer this for me or not, I would bet if you took that event out of the equation, okay, and that's a big event. But I bet if you That's took that event out of the question, that just the relationship with either him or her or both of them was that kind of like a lot of a lot of disapproval or criticism or definitely you know? yes okay absolutely. so see yeah whoops I almost lost something there um, that <laughs> that is much more powerful because that's the daily messages that you're internalizing see and this is going to become really important to to your healing that okay. when we are when we're kids you know the cement is still wet right so every mm -hmm. interaction uh, people are writing their names in the cement they're writing messages in the cement and then, and then that starts to form, and then we've got this software in our heads. What was once on the outside becomes inside. The messages we heard outside live in our heads. And so when you're, mm -hmm. that happens in the context of relationship. And so in this relationship where, you know, you don't ever really feel okay, safe, good enough, and what's always at play is the question, am I good enough? You're always asking that. Then your system learns to stay activated all the time to try to answer that question. Am I good enough? Am I, are they happy with me? Is this okay? Are they gonna be? And so when it's activated to answer that question, we call that hypervigilance, then it's scanning the environment for cues to answer the question. So is somebody smile at me? Do they mm. like my dress? Does he notice? So you have this kind right. of activating radar scanner is like a police scanner or like a you know whatever you know equipment that you're looking for it's sort of like your cell phone you turn it on it says searching for a connection well you're searching for always an answer to am i good enough or not all right nice. so great what do you do with that well here's the good news right the good news is in the same way that that got laid down and carved into your head, that's the same way that it gets healed. And see what people do is they try to stay in their head and do all this kind of self-help stuff along the way. And, you know, I'll put little stickers up on the mirror and say, I am special and all that. But the, but all that stuff mm -hmm. is still wired deeply into the emotional system of the person, which by and large at its core is relational. So here's what I would mm -hmm. want you to do. I would want, have you ever been any good, been in any good, significant depth oriented therapy? I really haven't. I really okay. haven't. All right. Have you ever been, excuse me while I move the, the camera here a little bit. Have you ever been in a good long-term small group with the same people and they're all loving and accepting and you guys really process your failures and your hurts and your wounds and all of that together? Uh, again, no. <laughs> okay. I think right, I need so that. I think you need that, Lynn. And so see, I got a mess yeah. big message. I got a big message for you here. You're not bad yeah. and you're not a failure. You're right. just on pause. So okay. if, if somebody builds a house in how old are you? 52. 52. Okay. So you're, you're just a spring chicken. You got lots of great 
years oh. to go fix this and enjoy. <laughs> All right. So if somebody builds a house 52, what are we talking about? In the 70s, roughly? Mm-hmm. Um, late 60s? Okay. So somebody builds yeah. late 60s. Where do you live? Dallas, ranch style house, one story. It looks like this. And you got, you know, <laughs> shark and orange and chartreuse greens that go out to the pool. Okay. If somebody builds that house right there in Dallas, in, you know, out mm-hmm. there, you know, in my White Rock Lake or whatever, then, and they, and they wired a certain way. Okay. And certain things don't work. Well, you come along now or somebody c- comes along now and they buy that house. Is that house bad because that stuff doesn't work? No, it just hasn't been remodeled. See, mm-hmm. all of this stuff stays fixed in yeah. our head. That's why the thing about time cures all things is BS. That is not true. Tell that to an infected finger. Just because the years go by doesn't mean anything is getting healed. So, mm-hmm. What you're going to do, I hope, is you're going to find a good depth-oriented therapist to unpack all these dynamics where you can begin to unload all of the things that hurt you and your failures and your wins and losses and this, that, and the other. And you're going to get these voices out of your head, number one. You're going to recognize, no, wait a minute. That's not, that was them. That's not me. Okay. And you're going to Mm -hmm. offload the power thing that, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is confess the sins of your fathers, right? The traditions of your elders and separate those from mm-hmm. you. And then the other thing is I want you in a community, a small group. You could go to a local church, find Celebrate Recovery, or you can find a support group or a therapy group. And you're going to be connected with in both the good and the bad of who you are. And then you're going to learn that, it's okay if your hair is not perfect. It's okay if you're hurt sometimes. It's okay if you screw it up, that people are still there and that's going to rewire that. And then the third thing is you do need to work on your thinking. Okay. And you've got to become, mm-hmm. when these thoughts start, you got to change that. And that's what all the, you know, the cognitive therapy people will tell you. I would suggest you go to, to boundaries.me and sign up there and you mm-hmm. can look at it for free I'm on there, yep. what's that i'm on i'm okay, on there good. i'm so, signed up i'm a member yeah I love all right it. love it okay then uh, then all is going to be there especially right. the thinking things and go look up the three p's but that's how this is going to be fixed and i would suggest my book changes that healed and specifically the section on okay. the good and the bad all right okay Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are so you going to, are you, are you, you going to, are day. you going to do this? Are you going to do this? You have my word. Okay. You have my I word. Got your word. The plan works if you work the plan. So thank you for your call. That's and right. okay. we just took a, thank one you more so big much. step, one more big step to finding the That's war against right. dysfunction. Cause it's not going to live in Lynn's head anymore. Now the rest of you, come on guys. Some of you hear me say this all the time. Right. I say, you got to get connected to some sane people. All right. If you're going to overcome the deeply wired relational software in your head that got laid down in difficult relationships or by trauma, then you've got to get connected with some people that respond to you emotionally encourage your boundaries and strengthen your ability to have self-control accept the imperfections in you and the pains and the hurts and the wounds and value and believe in your strengths and talents and abilities encourage you to go chase them down and do something with them go do this okay and i'm not just telling you something that i don't think is important Okay. I have, when I first learned all of this decades and decades ago, I have always, 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 there may be a little window of time here and there. I can think of um, a little window, a few years maybe, 
But since I was in my 20s, I have always, always, always had those elements going in my life and investing time and energy and money into them. Okay. Very, when I, as part of my training, okay, um, as a psychologist, two things were required, required for us. One was individual therapy. Okay. And the other was group therapy. All right. And so, when I got in those and training and now I'd, I'd already done that when I got depressed in college, but I got into them in training. And at that point, because I wasn't just trying to survive, I was trying to, to grow. I learned, wait a minute, this isn't something you do when you're just trying to survive. This is a growth path. And I learned the value of, of deep one-on-one -on -one healing interactions and growth interactions, which, you know, then I added, you know, uh, coaches and mentors and stuff like that. And then also the group piece. And, you know, Tori and I shared with you when she was on the program, the, the two of us, we've been in the same couples group um, for uh, now, I would guess it's going on about 16, 17 years with the same couples. And that, you know, if you try to do it weekly, it doesn't always work out that way, but maybe at least every other week, you know, that group is together. And in between together, if somebody's hurting or something, you know, you're going to know it on the group chat. And see, that kind of connectedness in our lives and then finding mentors that walk us through failure. And, you know, I've had business mentors that, 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 that do the same thing. Look, I'm saying all this to say when I talk to you about this stuff, first of all, I'm telling you, I'm telling you the, the science of it. Everything about what I'm telling you is the absolute evidence-based truth that this is the way that people get better. And this is the way the the highest achievers in the world work. They don't do it alone and they don't do it without help. I wrote a book called The Power of the Other, meaning everything that's ever accomplished, part of the way that happens is the other people that build into you what you need to do to accomplish it. If you go to that book, um, you know, I should walk in my study right now and, and, and just get a copy. I, I list like these incredibly high performers in every area of life, you know, whether it's business like Warren Buffett or whether, or Bill Gates or whether it's in sports, you know, like any of the great quarterbacks or golfers like Tiger Woods or, uh, you know, all these areas of life, I list these people that you would recognize and then list their mentor or their coach. Nobody gets there on their own. So what I'm telling Lynn to do, um, I want that for you as well. Okay. And one of the things that um, I feel most blessed with is is the people that have helped me survive and then thrive and that's the biggest asset we have so don't let that be happenstance in your life go do it intentionally and you may have to go somewhere where somebody hangs out a shingle and charges you for it that's fine tell me something better you're going to spend your money on Okay, let's go back to the phones. Uh, Jessica, who's calling us from Oregon, um, has a question about her son. Jessica, welcome to the program. Thank you for taking my call. I appreciate it. You're welcome. How can I help? Okay, so I am um, a single mom. I And my son is um, not really respecting me. And um, I don't have a lot of support from his father. Um, how old, how he's old got a is lot of son? narcissistic tendencies. How, he's how 15. old is your son? 15. Okay. All right. Keep going. So he, he does a, Okay. What does not respect look like? Um, just making kind of rude comments. He's made it very clear he wants to go live with his dad, which I completely understand is normal you know normal can be normal um his dad has shut that option down we share 50 50 custody 
And sometimes when he, um, he has a lot of anger because we went through divorce and then I got diagnosed with cancer right before the divorce finalized. Um, uh, and so he's got a lot of, um, it finalized in March of 2019 and we were separated for two years before that. Okay. So it kind of started when he was about 12 or so. Mm-hmm. Okay. So he's in denial right now and doesn't see that there's any pain or hurt or anger. And it's always, he blames everybody else when um, he's angry. Okay. And um, when he gets angry, he does, he can escalate into more of a rageful um, stage. And that's where it's becomes unsafe for my daughter and I. And so I have taken, um, so he has um, threatened violence and he has, you know, hauled off and hit his sister and it's not the normal brother sister thing. It's when he's in the rage is what I'm concerned about. And so we have talked about it. We have, I have set boundaries that it's not okay to do that in the house, that it's, that it's not okay to hit anybody. Um, I have just for the record have reached out. I'm, I'm in counseling. I've reached out to counselors. Um, we've talked to the police just to kind of find out what to do if it does escalate even more. Um, okay, and, so that, that, that was reported um, to the police. Okay. So, so yes. what you're in counseling, is he, he's in counseling with you, I presume? Not yet. Um, I have, I told, I gave him the choice if he needs to take an anger management class or go to a counselor and um, he and his dad are not for the, um, for counseling and don't see that there's a problem at all. And so, um, his the dad, okay, that, wait a minute. The, 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 police, the police are involved with this kid because of his anger issues and his dad doesn't think there's a problem? No, I have just called the police like separately, not when we're in the moment, um, and talked to no, them about what to do but and it, what. But his dad, but his dad so, knows about this. His dad knows about this, right? He knows about the anger issues, yes, but he just blames it on me that, well, if you didn't use that tone of voice, then maybe that wouldn't happen. Oh, so, brother. and it doesn't okay, happen so, at his house. So, so it's so what if, what if, not you, impacting you, him. You, you've set some boundaries and you've told the kid, you know, you can't mm -hmm. do this. And if you do this, what happens? I told them that if he does escalate to that point, then I will be calling the police. Okay. Like in the about, moment, if he. What, that's great. That's great. But what about the not escalating to that much? What about just being. A normal respectful kid what kind of boundaries are there around that um i've set the expectation of to be respectful to people and then um when he smart uh, makes a rude comment or disrespectful i just i said spence i said that's not okay um you know okay. i to treat me that way and he actually apologized that time, but a lot of the times he doesn't. So I guess I just need help knowing kind of, I've been able to verbally yeah. set the boundaries. So my counselor has told me if a boundary without enforcement is merely a suggestion. And so I just Thank need you. to know better how Thank to you. enforce boundaries. There you go. Uh, your counselor is exactly right on. Let me give you the, the one, two, three rule. Okay. Number one, we set the okay. expectations. Okay. Number one, you set the expectation. Joey. Um, I don't like it when you call me names, okay, or or when you, you know, whatever it is that he does, and be specific about that. So we, he knows the behavior that you're talking about, okay? So I don't want you to do that, yeah. all right? <clears throat> now, here's what's going to happen. If you do it, I'm going to let you know, okay? And when I let you know, say, okay, that's what I'm talking about. Stop it right now. Okay, and when, because if it happens again, then this is what's going to happen. You're losing some privileges. You got to whatever the consequences are that matter to him, and you never mm -hmm. deviate from the three steps. Okay, so that's what your counselor's saying. You're telling him stop it. He does it again. Stop it. Tell us again. Stop it. Stop it. You know, <laughs> you, you saw my dog earlier, um, right? And and so I've been, you know, in dog training, um, <laughs> coaching with her. And I, mm -hmm. I don't mean to be, I, I don't mean to be crass about this. This is literally because I've I've been 
in dog training for for decades really I, I i've trained a bunch of german shepherds i love dog training and um i have trainers that coach me and <clears throat> rule number one and i always tell people if you you know if you want to learn about parenting get an aggressive breed dog a big dog that you got to train rule number one is you never ever give a command that you can't enforce now what that means mm -hmm. with the dog is you've got them on leash and you you know you might have a pinch collar or something but you say no and if they do it anyway then they get a consequence and they learn oh i guess you're serious about this and then they stop doing it all right well it's no different with humans I mean, talk to the IRS, you know, they'll set the expectations. They, I don't even know if they remind you once or not, but if you don't meet the deadline, then certain things happen. Okay. So I want you to think about that three-step rule and I want you to sit down with them. I, talk, talk to your counselor about this first, obviously, because she or he knows way more, but I, I would like for you to try this, to sit down with him and say, so, you know what, Joey, um, I'm your mom and you're 15 and you're kind of you know you're kind of on your way out of here right you're here you're here for a while but 18 is coming and when you hit 18 you know who knows what you're you're an adult you can do whatever you want to um but i got three years here with you to and my goal in those three years is twofold one is i want us to have a good relationship and have fun together but B, I really want to use those three years to help you achieve whatever your goals and dreams are. And so let's talk about what would you like, what would you like when you leave here at 18? Where would you like to be? What skills would you have liked to learn? What experiences would you like to have had? And I would get a vision from him for his life in the next three years. And then I would ask, okay. Well, let's kind of let's build in some things where we can accomplish those. And that may mean you join this league or it may mean we find you a coach or it may mean whatever. But I'm going to support you in this. And so we start with the positive vision and then you go into. And so there's also, you know, we need some expectations from each other about how we're going to behave with each other. And I would include me in that, you know, when. When I've got a problem with you, what would you like for me to do? Okay, how would you like for me to tell you? So what we want to do is we want to kind of design a map for him about what does normal look like and what are the expectations. So then when we deviate from it, we know these are going to be the consequences. And so I would start there. Now, the third thing is really, really important. And I want you to, if you haven't done this, um, I would get him a a good psychiatric evaluation because if his rage is getting to the point to where he can't control it you know this is the age where sometimes you know you see some things begin to kick in like mood disorders and stuff like that a b he does have trauma right you know from from everything mm -hmm. that you've you've talked about but I, I would want to evaluate it just to make sure that that uh that there's not a missing diagnosis of a mood disorder here that 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 should be treated, and I would hope I would hope he'd find a good adolescent counselor, so a good psychologist that works with teenage boys. So that's kind of how I would approach this. Thank you. That's very helpful. I would like to okay. make sure that, especially with the rage management, that it's a phase, not a lifestyle for him. Well, it's going so. to be. It could be a phase. But what here's what you don't want in behavior problems. You know, we all we all can have a problem or an event or act in a certain way or whatever, and that's fine if we fix it. Okay. So if we say, gosh, my bad, that wasn't good. I gotta do better. Here's how I do better. Here's somebody that's gonna help me get better. Then we fix it. But left left alone, what happens is that instance turns into a pattern. And once you got a pattern, then that wiring is just going to continue to repeat itself. And so the other thing about this is you might, because you mentioned there's a husband in here who's not on the same page and 
you might want to check with your attorney as well to find out, you know, what kind of uh, leverage you actually have to get some of this done if the father resisted. Okay. That's what I would, would do. Okay. And, you know, um, you know, ultimately, and he could learn this, um, you know, sometimes we have to say to teenagers, I want you to live here. I want you to be able to do your sports. I want you to be able to do school and this and the other. But sometimes somebody's behavior is such that they can no longer live at home. They got to go live in a residential treatment center. And you know what, buddy, the courts will decide that for you, or I might decide it for you. So I want you here, but I, what, but nobody lives here. Who's going to be violent. That just goes without saying. Okay. So he's got to know that, you know, you, you're, you're serious about this. Okay. Hope that's helpful to you. And, and sometimes oh, residential, you. residential treatment is a good option anyway. All righty, let's go back to the phones as we are continuing here. We've got, um, I think we have time for uh, one more. Um, let me see where we got going here. Um, oh, well, we have a, another question about a rebellious teen. I think we just kind of, I hope that will um, help our other caller here who had, um, she says, a rebellious team doesn't take no for an answer. Um, well, then what's that no backed up with? Okay. I mean, for example, if I go to a Coke machine and there's no Cokes in there and I say, give me a Coke, give me a Coke, give me a Coke. I keep putting quarters in there, but it keeps saying no. Okay, I, what do you mean I don't take it for an answer? <laughs> I have to take it if it's real. So the big answer to that one is, does your no mean no? That's the big question. People learn to ignore ignore no when the boundary has no consequences. I would would say go to boundary.me and there's plenty of plenty of videos on there to explain all that to you, but I think it's similar to what we just had. So I'm, I'm going to take a quick, uh, quick um, moment here with um, Rada, who is calling us from Switzerland, our first international caller of the day. Rada, welcome to the program. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you so much for taking my call. I just wanted to say that I called in July and um, uh, I was able to set a good boundary with my boss and um, uh, couple of me and people who have the same boss are uh, reading your book, One Life Solution, and oh, we're cool. discussing it. And one, yeah, and one of my uh, colleagues um, read the book and went into therapy because he realized that was a big problem. So um, yeah. it's so it's, this uh, this work problem, so this I, boss is so difficult that now people are going to therapy just to deal with the boss. Right, and uh, what is good for me in this case is that I have we have created a small support group, so we have that's connecting. Great. Yeah, that's great. However, um, I have a question regarding Remind, remi behavior. reminds um, me of the movie know. Nine to Five. If you ever saw that, <laughs> uh, no, I didn't. Yeah, it's um, a dollar but, party. Um, anyway, I go, would just like to say that. Uh, so I'm just curious if you could give me a uh, uh, definition of bullying. And can a bully learn to become wise, or is a bully an evil person? Oh, that's a good question. Um, now, she's referring to, in that, in that book, in, in Necessary Endings and some other places, I talk about kind of three categories of behavior, and people can kind of live in or fall into one of those three. The wise person is somebody that when you give them feedback, tell them that they're hurting you, they say, oh, gosh, you're right, I'm sorry, and they change. The fool or the mocker is somebody you give them feedback and they turn around and blame you. Well, it's your fault. If you weren't doing this, then eh, eh, eh. and they never own their behavior and they don't change and they don't take feedback. And then the third category is the evil people. And the evil people are actually trying to hurt you. You know, they literally are out to hurt you. And and you know, the second category, the defensive fool, they hurt you, but they're not really trying to hurt you they just hurt you by avoiding responsibility for themselves and also um not taking ownership so um it sounds like what you think you're dealing with here rada is um 
he doesn't has he been has he been talked to about this bullying behavior this boss no but i would just like to know the, your definition because um this this person who went into therapy told me that he was told this was a bullying so i just would like to understand the definition better oh gosh i don't i don't know if i have a it's sort of like that thing you know you know it when you see it but bullying mm -hmm. i guess the way i would think about it without getting the exact words right is bullying it is when somebody uses their power or strength or perceived power because a lot of times bullies don't have power they just convince people they do when they use their power mm -hmm. to to hurt people in some way and so it can be verbal bullying name calling putting people down being critical angry outbursts so verbal bullying, certainly there's physical mm -hmm. bullying, physical bullying. That's when you go punch mm -hmm. somebody like you see on the schoolyard. Sometimes there's financial bullying mm -hmm. that people do when they have power to affect somebody financially. OK, there's there's legal bullying. Mm -hmm. People will use the court system and do an onslaught attack of people. There's cyber bullying and this is where they do it online. But it's basically when you're trying when you're trying to inflict distress or fear or harm to someone. That's the way I, I think of bullying. Right. You just you're just treating them badly. Bullying, Everybody knows what a schoolyard bully is. Yeah. Yeah. And can bullying become gaslighting if he blames a person and then tells person that it's I mean, he has I'm not sure. done that to me, but he has done it to others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, a lot of times, a lot of times bullies will hurt somebody and then they'll try to talk them out of, well, that didn't hurt you. You know, what's wrong with you? You're, you're oversensitive or there's something wrong with you to talk you out of the reality. It's clear to God and the Beverly Hillbillies that I just did something hurtful to you. So gaslighting, and if you go mm -hmm. to boundaries.me, I've got a whole course on there on gaslighting. Mm -hmm. So go sign up for that and, and you can look at it. Gaslighting is basically when we talk people, out of, talk, talk people out of their reality. And one of the ways that bullies sometimes mm -hmm. maintain power over somebody is they're actually gaslighting them to the, even to the point of where the victim feels like it's their fault. Mm -hmm. That's the worst. Mm -hmm. That's the worst. So yes. I hope that's helpful. That, that one hope person that's is helpful. leading, and yeah, yeah, and um, and just can you make a bully? Uh, can you give a bully a feedback so you know so that um, he can become wise? I mean, I mean, well, can, can that's the other thing that I'm, you know, I would, hmm. and and obviously there's, you know, there's things to consider all the time. You know, if you're if you're in the workplace about um kind of how to approach these situations and you kind of go from uh from normal to sometimes normal is too dangerous right um mm -hmm. because some people when you confront them you know can get really bad and they, if they have power over you it's even worse but normally normally the way mm -hmm. that this would be done is that somebody talks to their boss and i'll give you a quick sort of formula for this you talk to your boss say you know what i really want to um, I want to serve you well here. I want you to win. I want to do everything possible, you know, for us to achieve our goals and for you to achieve what you need to achieve there. Um, so I want to, I want to perform my best. I'd like to let you know that there are some things that happen sometimes that keep me from performing my best and doing the best job for you. And when A, B, and C happens, or, you know, then that kind of that that's difficult for me. I can't. And so you kind of point out their behavior and make them aware of it and say, could you not do that anymore? Here's a different way we can handle conflict. <clears throat> All right. That's step one. Mm -hmm. Step two sometimes is mm -hmm. if other people are experiencing the same problem as well, two or three people go talk to the boss together and have a similar conversation as that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes if you can't get resolution, on the one on one, another thing that you do is, is well, since we're disagreeing on this, if he doesn't listen, since we're disagreeing on this, then, then I'd like to call in um, another manager, okay, or your boss, mm -hmm. 
or whatever, mm -hmm. and you, you kind of go up the mm -hmm. chain. And most companies, at least in the U.S., you're in Switzerland, but most companies would have a human resources department. It's specifically in policies for this, where you can call HR and go in and talk to them confidentially and say, I got a problem with our boss, or we have a problem with our boss. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes HR's legal liability in the U.S. to, you know, mm -hmm. like, take care of the problem. And so generally you work at mm -hmm. it within the structure of the company. Now, ultimately, sometimes people say, who needs this? And they have their blank you fund, right? Everybody used to always talk about, you have a savings account somewhere in case you ever need to say, I can't take this job anymore. That's going to empower you to go find, find something else. And ultimately, ultimately in the U.S., at least there's legal recourse for being bullied at work. And and mm -hmm. if they don't if they don't listen to the normal messages back, then they get a you know they get a letter from attorney. Then yes, they can learn to be wise if somebody has enough leverage to have boundaries that have consequences. This is what whistleblowers do. Right. It's what HR departments do, and all that. So okay, I hope that's helpful to you. Yeah, yeah, that's very helpful. Just would like to thank you and to say one thing that. Um, uh, everyone else on my uh, team is Anglo-American. Uh, the boss is not Euro uh, the boss is European. So uh, it's really interesting that we have the support because they grew up in the U.S. or in South Africa. They have a um, different view on things than Europeans. And um, yeah, that's all I wanted to just mention. But yeah. thank you so much. Well, you know, I've 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 worked deeply with Swiss companies before. And not everybody mm -hmm. is like this. Not everybody is like this. I mean, my cultural experience is they have very high standards, right? High expectations, high performance. That's why they're so great at everything they do. But not everybody is a bully that works in a Swiss company. I know that from personal experience. So um, just because just because mm -hmm. just because he's European, you know, eh, I wouldn't let him off the hook, you know, just because of that. Okay, I mm -hmm. got to run. We are we're out of time. Okay. Um, thank you so much for your call, and you win the award being the first international, only international caller today. Sometimes, okay, guys. Um, so we are running out of time here. I want to um, let you know about a few things that might be very meaningful to you. Um, if you suffer from anxiety, fear, panic attacks, stress, PTSD. All the things that we tend to think about putting into this bucket called anxiety disorders or just problems with anxiety. They don't even have to be diagnosable. Just we have more anxiety and fear that we want to live with. I'm going to have a special event, a two-hour live webinar on overcoming anxiety that will happen on December 9th. And it'll be two hours right here, you and me. And you can sign up for it by going to boundaries.me forward slash anxiety. Now, if you can't be there in those two live hours, that's okay. Because if you sign up for the live event, you'll also have the ability to stream it um, for, I think, quite a while after that. And I'm going to have some workbook materials and all sorts of things and teach you, uh, <laughs> hopefully, within a two-hour span, Everything in the universe about anxiety, obviously not everything in the universe, but I hope to get at the main things of what causes it and what you can do about it. That's kind of my goal for that day. So anxiety, sign up by going to boundaries.me forward slash anxiety. And speaking of boundaries.me, that's our online portal where you can join, you put in your email address, you get signed up, you get a free trial. That's all you got to do. Just go in there and get the free trial for 14 days and you will have access to, I think it's about 80 courses that I have on there where I have filmed on all these topics from things we've heard today, dealing with your teenagers, dealing with your in-laws, dealing with your ex, divorce, divorce recovery, difficult conversations, anxiety and stress and financial infidelity and dealing with difficult people. All of those courses are on there for a free two week look see and then if you like it you become a subscriber like many others have too so i hope you go check that out boundaries.me 
And thank you for joining us and hope to see you um, again tomorrow as we do this every day, hopefully most days. And um, until then, be well and I'll see you then.